Don Bluth is an amazing director who is multi-talented and just overall a great guy. He's made some classics like The Secret of Nim or The Land Before Time, as well as some underrated gems like Rockadoodle or Titan AE. But like every filmmaker out there, he has his mistakes. Especially that one film. Every director has that one film. The one that they made and it just didn't pan out and is often considered to be the worst in their library. George Lucas has Strange Magic, Stanley Kubrick had AI, Steven Spielberg also had AI, and Don Bluth had a troll in Central Park. For the longest time, this thing had a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. People the world over considered it Bluth's absolute worst film. When it came out, it made less than 1% of its budget, making about $75,000. And even the cringe king himself, Doug Walker, took a stab at it way back in the early 2010s. But is the movie really irredeemable? Honestly, I'd say no. I think that the way it is now, it's pretty freaking bad. But if we retool it a bit, we can make it something really worthwhile. However, things got a little strange here at Media Mementos when Billy and I decided how we were gonna make this thing work. I had one vision and he had another, and then we realized, what if for this one, and maybe this one only, maybe we'll do this again some other time, who knows, definitely not every episode, but anyways, we're each gonna share our own vision for how we think this could work. See, a troll in Central Park is very unique because it doesn't really have a story. It just has a couple plot lines and some little themes here and there, which means it can be adapted to work for adults as well. Sit back and relax, or at least as much as you can, because we're going to tell you how we would have made a troll in Central Park. By the way, this is a Patreon raffle review courtesy of MD the Dude. If you'd like your idea for a Media Mementos video to come to life, then check out our Patreon, why don't you? Because that's the only way we take requests. Sorry, not sorry. Anyways, on to my part, which is the more family-friendly alternative. First off, it's always bothered me that in the movie, the trolls don't like flowers because they don't. That doesn't really seem like a very good motivation, you know, given the fact that there is no motivation whatsoever. The whole point of the movie is flowers. Let's be real. It's about flowers. You could say it's about family or selfishness. No, it's about flowers. And if we want our villain to really be taken seriously, even in a kid's film, what we need to do is give the trolls a reason to not like the flowers. So what if in this version of a troll in Central Park, all the trolls are scared of them? Kind of like how the monsters in Monsters, Inc. are scared of the children. Only instead of them being allergic, they're just terrified because they're dark, they're evil, they're mean, and obviously something so pretty and bright would terrify them to no end. Like, maybe even to the point where when someone sees some of Stanley's flowers, they see them and run away screaming. Stanley doesn't like this because, obviously, he has the ability to grow flowers, so he thinks that flowers are very misunderstood. What's not to like about him, right? So he'll try to get people hooked onto flowers by showing them what you can do with them, like make a whole menagerie of them. You can hang them on the wall and make different kinds of art. You can write about them, you can collect them, you can take pictures of them, and of course, the trolls don't like it. So they turn him into the number one flower hater in the land, Ganorga, the queen of trolls. Don't change a thing. Ganorga and King Lord are the only two consistently good characters in the entire movie. Especially Ganorga's song, they need to be kept 100% the same. The only slight tweak I think would just be make them afraid of flowers, but even then, I really don't think you would need that. It's often implied in the movie, although probably unintentionally, that King Lord doesn't mind flowers, and Ganorga hates them because, well, We've already established this, there's no real reason in this version. So she could hate them out of fear like the rest of the trolls, or she could hate them because she's evil and that's that. So just like in the original movie, Stanley gets banished to Central Park, but we need to make it very clear that Ganorga and Lort made a mistake. They were gonna send him somewhere, but let's say that in this case, when she was sending Stanley to the Land of Rock and Steel, something happens like, say, 
Stanley's freaking out because obviously he doesn't want to go to this terrible place and he's holding a flower and then drops it and the audience sees it and they freak out and they start running around and screaming and tearing the courtroom all up and Ganorga's like, hey, what's going on? Hey, hey, stop this, stop this. So when she's using her magic, she's distracted, thereby making sense that Stanley ends up in Central Park which just so happens to be a very lush and green area. She thinks it works, however, and considers it a job well done. So Stanley's in Central Park and is like, hey, I'm having a great time here. This is awesome. So like in the movie, he starts growing all these little flower friends, but in this one, they don't just derp around and dance and say all these little micey nice things. They'll have actual personalities. Like Clover, who's little and scrappy, but has a good heart. Dandelion, who's very reserved and kind of self-pitying, which is a representation of how a lot of people view dandelions. Even though they're flowers, you don't really give someone a bouquet of dandelions. They're not really seen as a very important plant. They're just considered weeds, and this will be represented in her personality. Rose, the more bombastic and outspoken member of the group, I guess technically speaking the leader, and rounding out the cast is Violet, who... You know, to tie it back to the original troll in Central Park, to pay a little bit of an homage, so to speak, she'll basically be the nicey-nice simpering one, but Clover doesn't take too kindly to that and they often fight, which has to get broken up by Stanley or Rose. Often Stanley, of course, because he's the troll. He's the main character. He's gotta do something. Oh uh, yeah, we gotta focus on Gus and Rosie next. They're easily the weakest part of a troll in Central Park. They're annoying, they're useless, and all they do is just do all the worst things that most kids tend to do. They whine, they fight, nothing good. So, let's mix it up a little. Let's have Gus and Rosie be more interesting characters. I like the fact that Gus is a bit of a brat. However, it's all in his delivery. The director of this hypothetical version of a troll in Central Park needs to make sure that Gus is only annoying to the characters, not the audience. The way to do that is to change his motivation. Maybe instead of wanting to sail his boat, maybe Rosie's the one that wants to sail the boat and Gus is like, huh, you want to do that? That's for little kids. Which of course is ironic because he is a little kid. He could be kind of a Mike TV sort of guy. He's so focused on technology and whatever's hip and new and radical and tubular that he's grown up so fast. He doesn't really have a childhood anymore and even though technically speaking he's only like eight, in his head he thinks he's already an adult. He knows what's best, he doesn't have to listen to authority, which of course would round out to his character arc in the film. Over time Gus would see that technology isn't really where all the cool stuff is. You can find some amazing things in nature. While yes, not every single nature lover is going to have a magic green thumb that brings flowers to life, he's gonna grow close to some of the talking flowers, see some of the amazing things Stanley can do. And I like to think that he's in denial at first. He doesn't really want to admit that he thinks that this is pretty cool. But then eventually, just before the climax, he decides to finally break and say, yeah, this is cool. And then he and Stanley have an honest sit-down talk about how he feels and what he thinks of the world and all that. One of the problems with the troll in Central Park is there's never any time where they sit down and really talk. It's just loud, bright colored noise throughout the whole film. The awesome soundtrack is not a saving grace. It does not make things better. Which yes, by the way, keep the songs. Definitely keep the songs. But while Rosie is playing with the other flowers, Stanley could go over to Gus and say, hey, I'm really glad you're finally having fun here. And then he'd talk about his problems to Stanley and open up and realize, you know, I've been really mean to my sister and my parents and I don't really want to admit it, but I'm still a kid. I can still have fun. I don't really want to let these precious years go. Which, of course, would culminate right when Ganorga realizes, wait a second, Stanley didn't go to the land of rock and steel. And what's this? He's actually spreading more flowers all throughout Central Park. This is terrible. We can't let this happen. So she goes over there to stop him once and for all because if he's gone, that world won't have any flowers either. And the trolls that live there will no longer live in fear. I think it's a nice little touch to add this comedic element where they think that basically all the people in New York City are trolls. 
Let's say there's a scene where they look at New York City and they see like the cab drivers or a snooty Broadway director and they're like, oh yeah, these are some of the nastiest, most evil trolls there are. Oh, we gotta check these guys out. And then they find Stanley and then that's how this whole third act kicks into place. Now, of course, we have to address one of the biggest problems with the original film, and that's the filler. Despite the fact it's extremely short, once again, a lot of it is just Stanley making flowers and Rosie going, ooh, ah, and Gus going, this is weird. It won't be so much filler with these new characters. Rosie's toned down a fair bit, as mentioned. We haven't really discussed her a lot, but in case you can't tell, it's not just all ooh and ah. She's just a regular little girl that wants to hang out with her big brother, but he's just so angry with the world that he won't give her the time of day. So, in a way, she sort of finds the brotherly relationship she always wanted with Stanley. Stanley's the one that's helping her have fun and explore new things and, hey, even meeting new friends with the talking flowers. So they get to go on little adventures that they make themselves and he gets to play with her while Gus is always welcome to join, of course, but he's just not having any of it up until that one point in the film we already discussed. I'd say keep the climax basically the same and then at the end, Gus is like, hey, Mom, Dad, why don't we just have a family day? And they're really surprised because Gus hasn't asked for that, like, ever. But before they go, Gus goes back over to Stanley and thanks him for everything. And Stanley's saying like, hey, you ever want to hang out again? I'll be here in Central Park, waiting. Feel free to stop on by. And that's where the film ends. I wouldn't say that he ends up transforming all of New York City into a giant greenhouse. That ending I felt was a little weird, but I'd say maybe he just goes all out in Central Park, kind of making himself like a tree fort where he can finally live happily and free, as well as some new flowers getting created, interspersed with all these shots of Gus and Rosie maybe thinking back to some of the adventures they had, or just being happy with the family. And it would be, of course, played along with the song Absolutely Green. Despite the movie having some hit and miss songs, the instrumentals are always great, but there are two songs that I can say are 100% legitimately awesome, Gnorga the Queen of Mean and Absolutely Green. Hey, they rhyme! So, to kind of congratulate Absolutely Green for being an absolutely great song, I feel like we could give it a little bit of subtext in the closing of this improved version. We can substitute green for things like kind or wholesome or united and all those kinds of things. If we do go the direction of having all those shots of Gus, Rosie, and the family just being happy together alongside the shots of Stanley making his new forest home in Central Park, I think it really tied the theme together. The song already mentions kindness, although very briefly, but used in this context, you can interpret green as a whole number of positive things. The way I see it, this movie is really all about the effect of kindness, like a ripple effect. Stanley was kind to Gus and Rosie and he ended up changing their lives. And because Gus had his life changed by Stanley who was kind, he was kind in turn to his parents. And their lives were changed because now they can have a better relationship with their son like they used to have all those years ago when he was really, really little. Like Rosie's age. But then when we see Gnorga be awful to the other trolls, especially her husband Lort, we see that all everyone else gets in the land of trolls in return is exactly that. No one's happy, no one's prosperous, and they're doing it to each other, and they're making it worse. Now that Stanley has a fresh start, his kindness can really make a difference. And hey, maybe the audience can feel that they can do exactly the same. They can go out there, they can show people love and kindness, and, metaphorically speaking, see how green the world grows. So that was pretty wholesome, I gotta say, but now let's take a little bit of a turn. It's Billy's time to shine, so take it away, man. Let's see how dark this gets. Once upon a bleak evening, a band of trolls were preparing for their annual gore harvest, a festival celebrating the carnivorous history of the trolls. In order to achieve their goals of having a grand feast, they would use monstrous plants to ground up specific creatures for the food. However, as the years progressed and the harvest became more elaborate, the plants continued to become sparse. This was due to the trolls not taking proper care of them, since they would only feed blood instead of water. As the festival grew nearer, the trolls panicked over how they would proceed with only a handful of the plants left. All hope seemed lost, until a discovery was made. Whilst the fear was brewing, a smaller troll named Stanley was spotted creating flowers in his front garden. Realizing the amazing abilities, 
The troll, Keeley, his next door neighbor, convinces him to assist in creating evil plans for the harvest. Stanley agrees on the condition that he will get paid, because he doesn't like to use his powers to benefit others. Little did Stanley know, Keeley was saying this in order to manipulate his fixation towards her. Otherwise, it would have been much harder for the trolls to convince him. Soon after, the gore harvest officially began, with Stanley healing the already living plants and creating new ones to attack the other creatures. From the tiniest of fairies to the mightiest of griffins, no being was sparred from the wrath of the trolls' plants. A rousing success, the gore harvest brought all of the trolls together. Blood poured into giant mugs, bones were scattered across the tables, and piles of intestines wreaked the entire festival in the best possible way. Not all the trolls were celebrating, however, as Stanley was anxiously awaiting his reward for the services he provided, which he never got from either Keeley or the other trolls. Upon asking after hours of nothing, he was laughed at by his peers. Even Keeley, whom he admired from afar for her disgusting beauty, mocked him for wanting something in return. Outraged by the treatment he received, Stanley poured countless amounts of blood on the plants, causing them to weaken. He soon ran off, leaving the trolls to once again cower in fear over the death of their precious plants. Now, the trolls were furious towards Stanley, vowing to hunt him down for execution. Still filled with rage, the small troll planned to prove to those who wronged him the truth strength of his powers. His plan was to travel to uncharted territory, in a mysterious realm known only as New York City. Here, stronger, more dangerous creatures named humans roamed, alongside giant dogs, rats, and the extra rare alligators. If Stanley could use his carnivorous plants to devour those beings, he'll showcase just how worthy he is. Ready to transport to the land of rock and steel, the small troll uses special lilies that let him teleport to any realm. Closing his eyes, he is swallowed by the lilies, which lead him to emerge from another bed of lilies in Central Park. Amazed with the amount of plant life, Stanley held a huge leer. There was amazing possibilities for total destruction with just a simple batch of pretty flowers. During Stanley's reign of terror, another manipulated individual was sulking in mental anguish. Rosie Sputum is an aspiring dancer with an affinity for nature, feeling as if she has a connection to plant life. Unfortunately for her, not many people understand her specific interests. Often she'd be questioned and sometimes fall victim to manipulative friendships so others can shame Rosie for her passions. Not helping was Rosie's inept social skills, which caused massive miscommunication, especially in her dancing classes and performances. In particular, someone who appeared to share the same interests abandoned Rosie thanks to influence from unkind peers who wanted Rosie to look horrible for her attempts at communication. This caused major isolation and trust issues, leaving Rosie to continue her fixations. She couldn't complain though, plants and dancing are her life. If anything, the intense turmoil was a blessing in disguise that led her to greater opportunities. Sadly, nothing seemed to be working out, especially after word got out about her horrible experiences. Heartbroken, Rosie had contemplated taking her own life, choosing to bash her skull during a stroll through Central Park. Initially successful, she wakes up dizzy, eventually finding herself in Stanley's garden. Initially scared of the troll, Rosie quickly warms up to him because of his amazing powers. And at first glance, she admired the flowers much to the troll's shock. She picked a rose, closed her eyes, and touched it with her cheek. Delivering a brief sigh, Stanley wondered what she was feeling when in contact with that flower. Even more baffling, these typically carnivorous beings were also calm in the moment. Wanting to understand her odd emotions, Stanley created more friendly flowers. This in turn made Rosie feel more at peace than she was before. At this point, the troll had completely forgotten his sinister motives. In fact, he had a moment to talk with Rosie about why she loves the flowers so much. The colors, the forms, and even the lovely scents all played a factor into her admiration. However, what truly changed his perspective was Rosie's views about flowers being therapeutic. She opened up about having social anxieties and unfortunately having thoughts and attempts of ending her life due to the horrible people she encountered. In her eyes, you're always going to have rough points and encounter shitty beings. But the simplicity of the beauties of the earth can let you fight through the wounds. Night fell, and Rosie had to return home before it got too late. She thanked Stanley for listening to her and providing her comfort with his flowers. Taking these words to heart, Stanley recognizes how his flowers shouldn't be used for selfish gain, 
seeing that they provided ease for Rosie, it is clear that his creations can be used for good and comfort and love. There are always going to be jerks in the world, but continuing to lash out under the influence will only lead to greater isolation and therefore make it impossible to interact with new individuals. Later that night, the trolls catch up to Stanley, impressed by his work in evil plant growing and getting word about his murders of the countless animals in New York City. In a completely new turn, Stanley refuses to listen to them and tells them that he is no longer following a path of evil, nor will he focus entirely on his own gain like he had before. As an act of apology, he lends the trolls his lovely bouquet of gold roses. Because the hearts of the trolls were so cold, they melted into chunks of blood and bones, literally dying from the idea that a hideous creature would be able to redeem themselves. The bouquet lay in the puddle of blood and bones, creating strange, glittering blood that only created more beautiful flower beds. Amazed, Stanley paces around the park, now a happy troll wanting to spread his newfound love throughout the area. Following the victory, he anxiously awaits the arrival of Rosie first thing in the morning. To no surprise, she showed, but had brought along new friends and freshly plucked asters for Stanley. Both at peace, the troll and the human roam the lively realm of Central Park, reflecting on their discussions of life and vowing to enjoy their existence while they can. We hope you enjoyed today's video on how we would have made a troll in Central Park. Comment down below to let us know which version you like best. And before I head out, I would also like to thank the Patreon producers, Leaf Razor, Azarius, Whoop Doo, Michaela Bellamy, Empty the Dude, and Blackjack. If you would also like your name read at the end of every video along with these fine folks, then please consider donating to the Patreon. There's a link down below. And now let's go on to comment of the day because I, I keep forgetting it's a thing. This one comes from Vector the Crocodile. Uh, not the Vector the Crocodile, it's just some alias. A really funny alias. When this first came on, I was so confused. Was this the epic story they promised? Now I find it painfully meh, especially how most episodes are the exact same. I think that shows how uninterested everybody was in making this. The creators, minus Max, must have met up and shared notes and log lines to help cut down on the work needed. Well, he basically just summed up everything you needed to know about this whole stupid promo uh, publicity stunt thing anyway. I mean, again, this was just meant to promote cheese. And so it ended up just leaving all the creators to be held at gunpoint to make all these really dumb blend together episodes, minus the Billy and Mandy one, of course. Now, I'm not overly familiar with this whole scene and invaded deal, but all I'll say to conclude is cheese to space does not make any sense to me. So, yeah, that's basically all I got now, so. I'm gonna go open my own flower shop, I guess.